Well, good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning. We've already had church, amen? amen. Just a couple of very quick reminders uh, before we get going into what's going on in the Word this morning. And it's not going to be a long word, but it will be to the point. How about that? Uh, first and foremost, I want to encourage you, starting, of course, she, Pastor Shelley said next, it's at next Sunday we start our fast. Is that right? Next Sunday, we start our fast, and I want to encourage you to join us in starting that fasting with us, 21 days of prayer and fasting. But as we fast, I want to encourage you to do something else. I know we live in a different world, uh, and I know that we're all about convenience. I'm going to encourage you to find your Bible. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? And I'm going to encourage you to bring your Bible to the house of God once again. Yeah. Somebody say amen. amen. Uh, it, it's important. It's not just old school, it's important. Uh, and my promise to you is I'm going to go slow enough that you can open your Bible and, and, and uh, be able to read along with us in your Bible. I know it's on the screen. We all get it's on the screen. We become lazy because it's on the screen. Yeah. Amen. We, we need the word. And we need to have a word where we can mark it down and come back tangibly say, here's what the word says right here. And so I'm going to encourage you to bring your Bible to the house of the Lord uh, in the next, next 21 days. Make it a habit, amen? Also, I want, I want to recognize we have a great team here that work hard. You know about all our, our pastors. You've seen Pastor Chip and Pastor Tyler and Pastor Glenn all the time. But there's people who work behind the scenes all the time that you may or may not know about. Uh, every week we have great sound because Nathaniel Fields is up there uh, running sound. Where's, he, where's Nathaniel at? Did he disappear somewhere? Where are you at, Nathaniel? Where are you hiding at? He went out over there. Okay, there he is right there. There's Nathaniel. Let's give Nathaniel a hand. Well, I've discovered this year I turned 54. In March of 2019, I'll turn 55. You know what that means? Discounts. <laughs> I, I've already discovered some of them. I, 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 I am putting it on my list, some of the discounts I'm going to start applying uh, when I turn 55. There are some advantages to getting older. Somebody say amen. amen. Kind of like this elderly couple. They were celebrating. They just celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary. They had been childhood sweethearts. And so what they decided to do is to simplify their life. They moved back to their old neighborhood that they grew up in. Uh, so they could reminisce and something familiar in their old age. And so one of the days they decided they were going to walk back to their old school. And so holding their hands, they walked back to their old school. Uh, it wasn't locked. <laughs> so they entered and, and they found an old desk that they had shared. Uh, and there on the bottom of the desk was carved where it's Andy had carved, I love you, Sally. Isn't that cool? Well, on their way back home, a bag full of money fell out of an armored car, practically landing at their feet. Sally quickly picked it up, but not sure what to do with it. They took it home. There she counted the money, $50,000. Andy immediately said, we've got to give it back. Sally said, finders, keepers. She put the money back in a bag and hid it in their attic. Well, the next day, come knocking at the door, two FBI agents. Uh, they began canvassing the, number, the, the neighborhood for the money, and they knocked on the door. Pardon me, they said. Did either, either you find a bag that fell out of an armored car yesterday? Sally immediately said, no. Andy said, she's lying. She hid it up in the attic. Sally said, don't believe him. He's getting senile. <laughs> the agents turned to Andy and began to question him. One says, okay, uh, Andy, tell us the story from the beginning. And he said, well, when Sally and I were walking home from school yesterday, <laughs> FBI just stopped him right there and says, we're out of here. This guy's crazy. <laughs> there are some advantages to getting older. So as we come to the end of 2018 and begin 2019, we're going to endeavor in this new series, what we're going to call No Reruns. And what No Reruns is about is overcoming repeatable mistakes. How many of you here today want to overcome repeatable mistakes? Uh, repeatable mistakes can be something relatively new or something that has gone on for years. Over the next several weeks, of course, with God's help, we're going to overcome our repeatable mistakes so that we can make 2019 the greatest year in our life for the kingdom of God. Somebody say amen. 
So we're, gonna, we're going to focus in on one word today that is the foundation of where we're going. Uh, and as we focus in on this word, we'll go forward from here. The word is repentance. Everybody say it with me. Repentance. It's defined as sincere regret or remorse. And remorse is defined deep regret or guilt for a wrong committed. If you have your Bible, and when I hope you do, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You go to the New Testament, go over a few, few, ver few, few chapters there and a, a few books, and you're going to find 1 Corinthians right after Romans there. 1 Corinthians 7.10 says, For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow, but then Paul says this, but worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. Worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. Uh, what we understand is this, and we can put it in terms we can understand. Being sorry and not changing the actions that brought that sorriness about ends in spiritual death. The Bible doesn't teach just about asking for forgiveness of our sins. And we need to be clear about that. Although we believe that to be the New Testament as we know it today. We live in a world where oftentimes that we think that we just ask for forgiveness. Everything's cool. But the Bible doesn't simply teach about forgiveness of sins. It teaches about repentance. Uh, and repentance is sincere remorse. That comes from a place that says, I don't ever, 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 ever want to do that ever again. Now, I am big on the grace and mercy of God. How many of you love God's grace and mercy? Somebody say, amen. They are new every morning. But what the writer is saying here, what Paul is saying here in 1 Corinthians about spiritual death is something that applies to our life. Because what's going to happen in your life, we don't have to talk about conviction. We can talk about another C word, and that's condemnation. Because the minute that you have repeatable sin in your life, what's going to happen is you're going to live under continual condemnation and no longer conviction, and you're going to stymie your spiritual growth. Yes, God's grace and mercy remains the same because he never changes. Somebody say amen. amen. But your place and what God's called you to do is going to be hindered and held back because of this very fact. You're holding yourself back by this repeatable mistake. That's why we can't afford as Christians to come every week, week after week, and say, Oh Lord, forgive me my sins and go do the same things over and over and over and over and over again. Amen. amen. See, Repeatable mistakes or sins is killing us spiritually. It takes away our love and fervor for serving Christ. So let's talk about the truth about sin. You ready? We all know the passage, Romans 6, 23. If you don't know it, if you don't have it highlighted in your Bible, you probably ought to have it highlighted in your Bible because it's one of the equations that always works no matter what you think. Paul says in Romans 6, 24, the wages of sin is death. And that's real easy, isn't it? Everybody say it with me. For the wages of sin is what? Death. It always equals that way. But I want us to understand something. Most people, most all of us, we love sin, but we hate its consequences. And this is what the Apostle Paul is saying. There are always consequences. Somebody say Amen. You might love your sin, but I'm going to tell you there's always going to be consequences. Because sin feels natural to our flesh and to our nature. That's why it's so deceptive. Uh, and so why we can embrace angry words and we can embrace lustful actions. We can embrace greedy self selfishness and prideful boasting. You know why? Because it feels good to our flesh. Right. Somebody say amen. Amen. All these things feel good to our flesh. But the consequences of those things oftentimes is broken relationships. Lost time. Isolation and loneliness. Financial loss that overwhelms us. And so what we have to understand is this. We have to come and hate our sin and not just its consequences. Now, let me be 
let me key in on this so we all get it. We, uh, let me rephrase. We have to hate our sin. And when I say our, I should mean my. Because I'm not asking you to hate anybody else's sin. Did everybody hear what I just said? We have enough in our lives that you don't need to be pointing at everybody else's sin. You've got enough going on in your own life that you need to hate your own sin. So here's a key. The acceptance of myself and my sinfulness is the only excuse needed to continue in my sinfulness. The acceptance of myself and my sinfulness is the only excuse needed to continue in my sinfulness. So true repentance starts with this. It starts with a hate. That's a, that's a harsh word, isn't it? Hate for our sin. What that means is we can't take it as an acceptance factor and say, that's just the way I am. That's not how Jesus sees us. That's not how he saw how he saw us on the cross. Somebody say amen. amen. You understand it's a great offense to God when we, we try to bargain with him about our sin when he's already made the bargain on the cross for us. Amen. The acceptance of myself and my sinfulness is the only excuse needed for me to continue in my self, the sinfulness. Therefore, I have to come to a place where I hate sin. So let's redefine the new normal. Some people have lived with their repeatable mistakes and sins so long, they can't truly imagine how life would be different without them. See, I want us to understand, I believe, as I said earlier, I believe that God's grace is great today. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Let me tell you the good news today. He's not going to change tomorrow. He's not going to change next week. He's not going to change the week after that. But you know what? Our life is in a flux. Let me repeat that. Some of our lives are in a rut. That if something doesn't change, there's going to be some repeatable things that happen in 2019. That's right. You understand, there's not a ma something magical that happens on January 1st where our marriages automatically get better. Amen. Somebody amen, say Amen. I wish I could say that 40 pounds disappear on January 1st. Well, what does that mean? That we carry over a lot of things in our life. And that if we're not careful, what we've been doing, we're going to continue to do. And we're going to continue to get the consequences. But here's the problem with that. Consequences are compounded. Just like interest compounds in the bank, which I hope that it does. If your relationship is bad because of your sin issue, your marriage relationship, I want you to understand something. It's not going to get better if you don't deal with it. That's right. That's good. It's only going to get worse. You say, Pastor, I don't need anybody to prophesy that over me. I'm not trying to prophesy that over you. I'm trying to help you today. Amen. Somebody say Amen. So we have to redefine the new norm. No matter how great God's grace is, my sinfulness, listen, is not normal or acceptable. 1 John 5.21 says this, Dear children, 1 John 5.21, if you want to look there with me. Go to the end of your Bible, go to Revelation, back up a couple of books, and there you are at 1 John. 1 John chapter 5, verse 21 says, Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Keep away from anything. Everybody say anything. anything. Well, what does that include? That includes anything. And so what repentance is, and I want us to, we're going to think for just a moment. Is it okay to come to church and think? Because th this is the place where that word hate comes into definition when it comes to hating our sin. And repentance. Repentance has to be this new definition. Given the same opportunity, I would make different choices and decisions. You see, if you hate your sin, you can't go back and say, oh, the glory days of my sin. Somebody say amen. 
There aren't glory days there. You understand something. There's always a consequence to your sins. Somebody say amen again. And so we have to understand that if there's consequence to my sin, we have to go back and say, given the same opportunity, which there probably will be another opportunity, almost just like that, given the same opportunity, there will be different choices and decisions that are made. So you say, what is repentance? It's going back to that place where you failed and saying, God, I'm sorry, but with your help, with your help, somebody say, with your help, (laughs) God, with your help, I'm going to make a different choice and decision next time. You see, temptation is something that when we carry something in our heart, it allows us to be tempted. You see, David didn't fall into his sin just overnight. You say, well, there he was on the roof and he looked upon you. But in in David's day, it wasn't unusual for women to bathe all the time on the roof. What changed something that was in his heart? Because it was in his heart on that evening when he looked out and he saw her bathing over there, Bathsheba bathing over there. He said to himself, wow. I'm the king and I can have anything I want and I think I'll have that. That one sin leads to multiple lies and eventually leads to the murder of her husband by something that went unchecked in his heart. Now we have to understand this because if you read that story there in 2 Samuel chapter 12, which I hope you do, you're going to find that there's a great sting that comes with that sin. In fact, out of, out of the mouth of the prophet Nathan, he begins to prophesy on God's behalf. And he said, this is what the Lord says. Because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view, which came to pass. You did it secretly, but I will make this happen to you openly in the sight of all Israel. Say, it doesn't sound fair. Why is there such a harsh punishment? Well, this is a man, you understand, that took another man's wife, lied about it, and then killed the man. Under any other consequence of the law, he probably should be put to death. I would say he's getting off pretty lightly, but you understand there still is a sting that comes with sin. And that sting is going to be felt in his life when his son Absalom is going to carry out this very prophecy. And he's going to come to, in a great insurrection and rebellion and try to overtake the kingdom and lay with the king's wives in front of everyone in Israel. Oh, the heartache there was for David. Oh, as Pastor Shelley was speaking about, the brokenness in his heart over his son, but not just his son, his own sin. Oh, if he could have that night over again. Oh, if he had not allowed that to get in his heart, that when he was on that rooftop that night, I guarantee you that David would have said, I would have made a different choice and a different decision. Oh, if sin could be so clear to our eyes that we could go back and say, given the same opportunity, the same chance, I certainly would do things differently. You see, repentance has to be given the same opportunity. There would be different choices and decisions. You understand something. I've said it many times. We live under this great blanket of love and grace and mercy, but we've used that as a good excuse for our lives. While sin ravages our families, our homes, our children, our marriages, our, our, our very existence, God doesn't change. Somebody say amen again. God never, ever changes. But unfortunately, we come to church broken because we're trying to manage our sin. Uh, And there is no managing sin. It would be like saying, well, I'm going to manage this live culture of cancer as I put it into my veins. I'm going to manage that. You understand something? You're not going to manage that cancer when you put it into your body. And sin is the same way. 
So let's talk about the new normal. This is where we turn in really into good news. I was going through the word this, this week in my Bible study. Uh, and in my Bible study, I'm not looking to find a sermon. Somebody say amen. In fact, I, I'm not even looking to get something for me. Now, that seems like a new approach, doesn't it? Because we think, well, you read your Bible to get something for you to feed yourself. That is true. But do you, do you know why I read my Bible? Because I want to please God. Amen. I read my Bible because I want to please God. And so I'm reading my word and I, I'm in the, there in the epistle, John's first epistle, 1 John chapter 2 verse number 6 and I come across this scripture and I, I can't tell you in my lifetime how many times I've read this scripture but this is how I do my Bible study when I come and talk call something that I go whoa I don't keep reading no matter how many times I've read it if I read it and it has the woe factor on me again I stop right there and say okay Lord we're going to have to think and talk about this a little bit and this is one of those scriptures. Because for us as Christians, all of a sudden it puts the bar way up here. 1 John 2, 6. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Now, your, your mind might go to say, well, he's telling us we need to do all the miracles. That's not what he's telling us at all. How did Jesus live his life well how many times do you think in the gospel of john you hear jesus saying i've not come to do my work i've not come to do my will i've come to do the work of my father how about when they're on the mount of transfiguration and there they are <laughs> with pete jimmy and johnny and they're up there on the top and all of a sudden this voice comes and says this is my beloved son in whom i am well what is the word well what you know why? If we're to live our life as Jesus did, Jesus came and every decision, every choice he made was to please his Father. He never made a choice and decision in 33 years of life that was outside of pleasing his Father. He never thought about himself first before he first thought about his Father. Yeah. 33 years of life of submission and saying, I believe that he makes me complete. Now you understand if we are his firstborn and we are his children and he has called us by name, you understand we can search the world over to find something that's going to make us complete and more secure. Can I tell you something? There's not anything in this world that's going to make you more secure. The way you dress, a new car, a new house is not going to make you more secure. You're going to make same, the same stupid choices and decisions looking for something to make you secure and you're going to end up with the dire consequences once again. There's only one thing that makes us secure. Understanding who we are in him and living to please him. I was created by him and for him and my intent and purpose in life is to please him even before I please myself. Not my will, but your will be done. See, Jesus loved his father and did everything to please him. Now, we, we're in 1 John chapter 2, verse number 6. That's not the only place in 1 John you're going to find this type of reference. In 1 John 4, 17... He's talking about a day of judgment that we'll all face. And he says this, and as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. I think that's key today. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. Can I stop right here before we read anything else? Let, let's stop and let's ask an honest question. Is your love growing? Is your love growing? Or do you find that your prejudices are becoming greater? Your hates are becoming more? Your opinions and ideas are more? Is your love growing? You understand something. If you're living to please yourself, your love's not growing. But if you're living for God, 
Your love has the opportunity to grow. As Pastor Shelley said, you, you can forgive and literally you can forget. You say, that's not possible. It, it is when you make a choice to. When you repent and make a choice, you can forgive and forget. As we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. We can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. It doesn't say that we live like better people or a better product of people. It says we live like Jesus in this world. Why, what, what is that key to living like Jesus in this world? Once again, it comes back to that Jesus loved his father and did everything to please him. John 6, 38 says, For I have come down for heaven to do the will of God who sent me, listen to this, not to do my own will. And so we really have to address this love issue. Because the greatest consequence of our sin, let's be honest today, the greatest consequence of our sin is that it steals our love for God. Amen. The greatest consequence of our sin is it steals our love for God. We begin to make excuses. There are a lot of great theologians, and I'm going to tell you something, you can read them, but they're great excuse makers. Because somewhere along the way in their life and in their book knowledge, they forgot about their love for Jesus. He first loved me. He died for me. He desires and wants the best for my life. And when you understand that glove that is in your life, it, it can't be stolen. You understand life is full of consequences and broken heartedness because we live in a broken world. But when our love for God is stolen, all of a sudden we can be just as pa Pastor Chip was talking about this woman. We can be like the opposite of that where people are doing something just to do it, just to relieve their conscience, just to, get, just to get a sense from freedom of their condemnation. They don't have any intention to change, but their religion is just that little bit of opium that is religion that comes about that relieves them from the consequence of their sin and their guilt for just a little while until they go back into it. See, church can be addictive that way. Come on now. Church can be addictive that way. It can be addictive that we can come and it can relieve us of our guilt just long enough till we go back and we can be the person that we are. But you know what? That's not what Jesus came and died for. That's right. Amen. I told Pastor Shelley yesterday, God gives me marketplace opportunities outside of the church. I love what I do here at the church. Uh, but I, I, have, I have a group of guys, a social environment that I hang out around with, a bunch of guys I play golf with. And I came home yesterday. She said, well, how was it? And I said, it was a mission field. Because I, I realize that oftentimes, even as a pastor, I, I can give people the temporary relief from guilt. But it doesn't change the consequence of their life. It doesn't change the consequence of sin. The eventuality, you understand something, the eventuality of our sin is not just death here on earth, but eternal death. That's the eventuality of sin as we accept it as being the norm. The eventuality is that it kills the love for God in our heart and wanting to please him. And the next thing you know, we're putting a good spin on it, a religious spin on it, saying, well, I'm doing something. But our love is not there anymore. So how do we love God? Well, I'm going to say this because we have a lot of guys here today. But I'm going to tell you something. No matter how macho you are, the only really way to love God is to express love in your words. People don't understand what worship is all about. Worship is the expression. It's not just about music. It's not about songs. You know, we have all this other stuff that goes on up here, and uh, it's okay. 
I'm just being honest. I mean, you might, you might like it. All the, Tyler loves it all. He loves the lights and the, whoosh, you know. But the simplicity is I don't ever see it most of the time because I got my eyes closed. Because church is about worship. It's not about a show. It's about worship. It, it, when, I, when I close my eyes, I go back to the days of my childhood. That my mother, you know, in the simplest fashion, she was my spiritual mentor. My dad worked. And so she was involved in our lives and Shelley's life. She was, she was a, in our youth group all the time. And it wasn't unusual, especially when I was 13-year-old sitting way in the back. She'd come grab me by the ear and bring me up to the front and we'd pray. You say, yeah, you had a drug problem. I did. My mother drugged me all the way to the altar time and time and time again. And you know the simplicity of the prayer that we always prayed where it was the expression of our words. Can I tell you how I was filled with the Holy Ghost? Because I came down to the front and mom said, all you got to say is, Jesus, I love you. That's all you got to say, Jesus, I love you. If you'll express your love to him, he'll express his love to you. Amen. He gives good gifts. If you'll express your love to him, he'll express his love to you. God always reciprocates our words. If you'll express your love to him, he'll express his love to you. Do you think that God's going to go silent when you say, I love you, God? Oh, no, he's not. Don't you think that gathers his attention when you say, I love you, Jesus? You say, well, you're a man and you're saying that you love the Son of God. I am. Amen. I'm saying that straight up. <laughs> no hesitation at all in that. Can I tell you why? Because I understand that as that love is reciprocated, all of a sudden I love more. Amen. We've gotten away from this. I'm saying we, we've gotten way to the other end of the spectrum where it's not important. Hey, let's not make people feel uncomfortable. Can I tell you something? Sometimes it is uncomfortable. Sometimes the greatest breakthroughs I've had in my life, I was really uncomfortable spiritually. Every time my mama drug me down the altar, I'm going to tell you something, I was uncomfortable. I was embarrassed. What are you doing? By the time I had prayed the prayer and the tears began to stream down my cheek, I didn't care who else was watching. Because all of a sudden, God was reciprocating his love to me. He's real. Even in the heart of a 13-year-old, he's real. We need to express our love. See, we need to understand first and foremost we need to express our love in our works and number two is we express our love in action now understand something you have to do something intentional that pleases God people crack me up because all of a sudden you get to talking like this and the next thing you know they become bible scholars and say well pastor I'm not a legalist and can I tell you it is the stupidest argument on planet earth because there's not a relationship that is not dictated by discipline. That's right. Amen. Show me a relationship that's not dictated by discipline. Show me your marriage. You, you're telling me in your marriage that there aren't disciplines that dis dictate your marriage. You're telling me that you can go do what you want to, when you want to, how you want to. I'm going to tell you something. You ain't married. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Amen. Just try it one time. Go ahead and forget your anniversary and don't give her anything. See how that works for you. Amen. Let me rephrase that. Do not do that. <laughs> don't do that. The biggest trick in the world is when your wife says, well, let's not get each other anything. Do not follow into that trap. <laughs> That's not what she means. 
because she'll come back and get you the biggest gift. <laughs> and then you're sitting there like, I thought you said, you really thought I meant that? <laughs> you have to express your love in action. You have to, listen to me, we're talking about 2019, you have to change your habits. You have to do something intentional that pleases God. Don't read your Bible to feed yourself. Did you hear what I just said? Quit reading your Bible to feed yourself. Read your Bible because it pleases him. Pick it up, get it off the shelf, open it up and say, God, I'm doing this because I want to please you today. And this is going to teach me how to please you today. It's all here. I don't know how to do it, but I'm going to read and I'm going to learn how to please you today. Because I want to please you. Change your habits. Pray. You understand something. Pray not just for yourself, but pray because you know that that communication pleases God. And start with these words of worship. God, I love you. And establishes the open communication of love. It's the love language that's going on. And you know, I read through 1 John and it says that if we do what pleases him, he gives whatever we ask of him. Whatever we ask of him. It all comes back to our love language. Serve, not for yourself because you know it pleases God. Give, not because you're going to get. Give because it pleases God. Somebody say amen. I mean, we give you great opportunity here at this church, and, and some of you know that, that we, we are a giving church. That means we're going to bless people in our community. Thank you so much. We blessed all those people that were ravaged by the fires right before Christmas time. We blessed all of them uh, with, with gift cards to Walmart, over, you know, over $1,000 gift cards to Walmart. Uh, we, we have missions going on in Africa and Eastern Europe. Uh, there, there in the, the orphanage in the gypsy village there, the gypsy village there in Romania, we have ministry going on today that you support every month. Amen. That we understand we can't, we're doing that because we want to please God. Amen. Not just in this body, but around the world. We want to please him in all that we do. And so when you give to please him, it goes not just here, it goes everywhere. See, we have to take ourselves out of the equation and we have to begin to discover what the new normal is. So let's just come back and talk about what we're talking about today. Of course, you know the series is no reruns. We're talking about overcoming repeatable mistakes. So I need you to stop right now. No matter what you've been thinking, your line of thinking is, well, I wonder when he's going to wrap up. I'm wrapping up right now. And you're thinking about what you're going to go eat for brunch or lunch or what the Texans are going to do today. Let's stop that for just a moment. There's something far more important than that. Amen. Season's going to be over in a few weeks, but your life is going to go on. Your marriage is going to go on. The things with your children are going to go on. See, we're a world that we love distractions. We love distractions that are going to take us away from the real because we don't want to deal with the real. So give me social media. Give me my iPad. Give me games. Give me activities. Give me movies. Anything that can get me away from who and what I am. That, in fact, if you see the new norm that's coming into the world, is that people will no longer have to be who they are. They can be virtual of who they are. It's where the world is headed. A virtual world. Where you can escape and be somebody, not who you really are. Can I tell you something? When you go to sleep at night, you're still going to have to be who you are. Right. When you wake up in the morning, and I hope you brush your teeth... And look at yourself in the mirror, you're still going to be that same person. How can, we be, how can we avoid these repeatable mistakes? We have to begin first and foremost with repentance. 
This morning, I know you may be sorry. You may sit here and feel the weight of the Holy Spirit and say, I'm sorry for those things. But can I tell you something? Let's take this a step further. Let's say, God, I love you, and I don't ever want to do that again. Amen. Now, you may be sitting here today and say, I think that's impossible, Pastor. I, I've been doing this for all my life. As long as I can remember, I've been doing this one thing. I know it's wrong. I know it doesn't please God. <clears throat> but I think God's gotten used to it just like me. Can I tell you something? What if I told you today that you could be free in 2019? You say, Pastor, how is that possible? With God, all things are possible. Amen. You might have given up, but he hasn't. Amen. Because he wants the best for you. He wants you to be free. He wants you to be in, in a free relationship where you can give and you can love unconditionally without strings. Amen. That's right. Because that's how Jesus loved. Every day he did miracles for people who were trying to kill him and eventually were going to kill him. That's right. And were to live as Jesus lived. Well, that's, a, that's an uncommon love, isn't it? That can only come when we express our love to God and he expresses his love to us and he fills our heart with such love that it changes everything that we know around us. That's the kind of relationship you can have with God today. Will you bow your heads with me this morning? I want to pray with you today. And if you'll be one of the courageous ones today that will raise their hand this morning and say, Pastor, my desire for this new year is not to live with my repeatable mistakes or anyone else to have to live with my repeatable mistakes. Pastor, today I want my life to be different. If that's you, I want to pray with you today. Will you raise your hand? Pastor, today I want my life to be different. Wow. The majority of people in this, in this room today Lord, I have my hand lifted with them. Yes, Lord. Everybody with your hand lifted right now, nobody looking around. Let's just, let's just say these simple words. Let's start our prayer today with these simple words. Everybody, man, woman, child, all of us today and say, Jesus, I love you. Will you say that right now? Jesus, I love you. <laughs> it never fails. <laughs> Lord, that never fails. <laughs> anytime I express, anytime we express, it seems like all of a sudden there's this incredible affirmation and return of love. Lord, would you fill us, our hearts with your love today? Would you heal our brokenness? Would you hear our desires that say we don't ever want to do that ever, 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 ever again? that you're making us in your image and likeness. And Lord, we want to be like you, Jesus, that says, we want to please you before we please ourselves. So Lord, let that be the choice of our day that we say, Lord, I awaken today to love you. Lord, I love you today. I love you today. Return that affirmation on every person right here. Return that affirmation on them right now. Let them be, let their hearts be so filled with your love that it begins to change everything about them. That you're so real. That you're so loving. That you're so kind. Lord, restore broken marriages today. Father, bring prodigals home. Lord, let us love those who have done evil to us and forgive them today. Lord, only your love can do that in us. We can't do that in and of ourselves. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you join with us and lead us, direct us. And Lord Jesus, we will give you all the glory and all the honor and the praise because it's you that's doing it all. Amen and amen and amen and amen. Stand with me today. Now here's the challenge today. That how could we express his love? What would be pleasing to God? Well, what would be pleasing to God is for us to love one another. Somebody say amen. amen. I, I know we want to get out quickly. It's cold outside and things are going on. And we're still in a busy season and people are out of town. That's okay. 
Let's take a few moments before we leave today, shake a hand, greet somebody this morning, and tell them how much we love them today. Thank you for being here with us today. Happy New Year. You're dismissed.